I will try to draw out some of the implications of that counting. And in the process, I'm going to try to count things that are difficult to count, and perhaps some things that are uncountable, and perhaps some things that should not be counted, and perhaps some things that are the wrong things to count. I leave that to you to judge, for I see myself here um, more to suggest and to provoke. I do not see myself here to provide anything that is a final or even more than a preliminary word. How much richer are we today than those who came before us on this earth? By we, I understand first, those of us who sit in universities and watch Zoom calls, and second, those with whom we share our respective allegiances to the fictitious but very real communities that are nation states. And third, by we, I mean the entire human race, all of us who all draw the overwhelming bulk of our heredity from some 4,000 or so lucky East African plains apes 75,000 years ago in the Horn of Africa, people whose descendants have since spread out around the world, intermarrying along the way with other groups of homo sapiens and groups from other human species that we have run across. Fortunately for my task, other people, fortunately for my task, other people have not only tried to count, but have been brave and bold enough to put their attempts at counting out there in public. Here we have figures from the wonderful Gapminder project. Gapminder tells us that those of us in the United States today have an average real income of $64,000 of today's international dollar purchasing power value per capita. This international dollar, it's a rather strange attempt at a measure. In it, commodities are valued not at the relative prices in US dollars they have in the United States today, but rather at statisticians' guesses of the average or typical relative price structure in the world as a whole. It then benchmarks those values, so the value attributed to the United States is in fact the value of United States income per capita today using the United States' relative price structure. The hope is that this measure removes artificial inflation of real income gaps across the world artificial inflation that would be generated by the fact that commodities that poorer countries are relatively efficient and effective at making, they happen to have artificially low prices in the United States because the United States is so rich as to be really satiated with them. I do think this procedure is probably the best we have figured out currently how to do, but it is debatable. Now, Gapminder tells us that India today has an average annual real income level of 6,800 international dollars per capita, had a level of $1,200 per capita per year back in 1920, had a value of 1,000 back in 1870, six years before the proclamation of Victoria I of Hanover as Kaiser E. Hind, as Empress of India, and had a level of 1,200, the same as in 1920 back to 1800 three years after a young Irish aristocrat from a financially embarrassed family, a guy with no visible skills, save a not quite professional scale virtuosity on the violin, um, a guy Arthur Wellesley arrived in India and turned out to be a military genius as he worked for his older brother, Richard, the governor general of the East India Company. Gapminder tells us that life expectancy at birth in India was some 25 years in 1800 and is 70 years today. Gapminder tells us that in the United States, average annual real income per capita is now $64,000, that it was $5,500 back in 1870 and $2,000 back in 1800. Gapminder tells us that on this real international dollar measure, the US is now nine times as rich as India today, was five times as rich back in 1870, and was twice as rich you know, back in 1800. Gapminder also tells us that from 1800 to 1920, there was effectively no growth in average real incomes in India that from 1920 to 1985, average real incomes in India grew at an average rate of 0.44% per year. 
a doubling time, um, a doubling time of 1600 years or so. And that since 1985, average real income has grown at 4.13% per year, a very heartening doubling time of 16 years. But that's the average inequality has been growing rapidly too. Gapminder tells us that since 1800, growth in average real incomes in the United States um, has been near 1.5% per year, you know, a doubling time of 45 years consistently since 1800. Now, we can take we can take a wider view. We can step back to look at the world as a whole, um, looking at world averages, not just at India and American averages. We can step back to look at all human history since deep time, since the moment some 75,000 years ago when the several thousand of our ancestors who were the effective public size of the gene pool who are all of our primary genetic ancestors began to expand our population and then began the radiation that would carry their genes all over the globe, first in the Horn of Africa, then to the rest of Africa and across the Red Sea to Yemen and out to the wider world. Parenthetically, this radiation, this is only the first of four radiations I find particularly interesting these days. The second is the radiation of the grain-based societies of the agrarian age out of the Fertile Crescent of the Near East, even though agriculture was discovered multiple times. The third is the radiation of the languages spoken 5,000 years ago on the Pontic Caspian Steppe by the domesticators of the horse and the inventors of the wagon. A radiation vast enough that languages descended from their Proto-Indo-European tongue are now spoken from Bengal and the Deccan West all the way around the world to Perth and Singapore, a linguistic radiation. And the fourth is what I hope will be a durable and complete, but is now merely an ongoing global radiation of industrial technologies and supporting political and sociological ideas of reduced hierarchy, individual autonomy, and diffused social power. Um, in any event, I have written down here um, on the left side of the slide, a table of numbers, average world real income per capita, estimated human population, total world real income. I have been brave enough to go back 75,000 years and I have also projected forward. Assuming the world still attains, soon attains zero population growth and continues to deploy better productive technologies at the proportional rate it has since 1870, no global thermonuclear war, no civilization cracking under the burden of dealing with global warming out to 2100 and 2200. So what are these numbers? You know, what are these claims that I have to count? You know, for today, at least, we have numbers and estimates that technocratic bureaucracies have counted and calculated, stand behind, and will at least semi-justify. Those are the $11,600 annual average income worldwide, and the 6,900 million estimated population as of 2010. Going forward to 2100, we have sensible demographic projections expecting the arrival of zero population growth. And we can project technology and income to get a real projection. A population of 9 billion forecast for 2100 and a world with an average annual real income level of $50,000 per capita. A world average then as high as today's global north average, may it come to pass. And then we can draw those lines out further for another century and imagine at least a world of 2200 with an average annual real income of $400,000 per capita. ICS is unlikely to reach that world in which the average person is then three times as rich as my family is with me in my peak earning years but it would be very, very nice to get there. Going backwards from today, however, our counts lose authority um, and solidity. We have economic historians who have at least estimated what they regard as reasonable growth rates over 1870 to 2010. We can use these growth rates to project levels of world average income for 1870, but this introduces error. Growth rates measured with considerable errors induce, as we compound them back into the past, induce an opposing sign error in the estimate of past level. 
The $1,300 for average real income in 1870 is quite shaky, but we do have enough censuses to be confident of our 1.3 billion population estimate for the world as of 1870. But back before 1870, we go from estimates to guesses. I have written 750, 500, and 240 million for the world human population in 1770, 1500, and 800. These are demographers' well-informed guesses. I have written 250 and 15 million for the world human population in 150, minus 1,000, and minus 3,000. These are guesses. I have written 5 to 0 0.2 and 0 0.005 for the human population in 6,000, and then 10, 50, 70, and 75,000 years ago. These, these can barely even be called guesses. For average income, I've written $1,200 a year, $3.50 a day, as the average human real income level 10,000 years back and before back in the hunter-gatherer age before the invention of agriculture. This is poverty, this is deep poverty, but not quite extreme poverty, as the World Bank's current measures say it. It is not that the typical person back then was so hungry most of the time they had a hard time thinking of much else, and not so poor that the leisure time they took, they did so only because there was nothing additional they could do that they had the strength to carry out that would be productive. This $1,200 is a guess, but it is a not uninformed guess. It is an inference based on the relatively healthy gatherer-hunter skeletons that we have found and analyzed. For average world income, I have written $900 a year, $2.50 a day as the average real world income level from 8,000 years ago up until 500 years ago, um, back in the agrarian age. This is poverty, this is dire poverty. This is close to extreme poverty by the World Bank's current measures. The typical average person at such a living standard is indeed close to being so hungry most of the time, they have a hard time thinking of much else. The typical woman is close enough to being too skinny to ovulate regularly. The typical child is sufficiently malnourished to be stunted in their adult height by three inches or more although not the upper class. The upper class back then was as tall as we are almost, or so the skeletons we have found say. The typical child is, however, sufficiently malnourished to have a compromised immune system. And thus it is a world in which for women, the overwhelming, and for men, the predominant source of social power is to have living sons and families strain every nerve to do so. And yet one third or so of families are unable to accomplish this back in the long agrarian age. Their sons all die before they establish families of their own. Thus, while this $900 a year is a guess, um, it is, I think, a well-informed guess. It is an inference based on the stunted typical agrarian age skeletons and on the failure of so many families which have enormous material and sociological incentives to raise living sons to survive, to have managed to do so back in the agrarian age. And the $1,100 number for average world income per capita in 1770, um, that's an interpolation backed by the fact that population growth materially accelerated worldwide across the 1500 watershed boundary crossing between agrarian and imperial commercial age societies. That to me at least strongly suggests diminishing of the punishment inflicted by material necessity on a humanity beginning to crawl out from beneath the harrow of Malthus. Bureaucratic counts, you know, well-founded estimates and projections, informed guesses, guesses, barely even guesses. This table has problems. But there is, I think, a bigger problem. Is this table even measuring the right thing? When we speak of human wealth, what we are speaking of is of its usefulness to us. We are thinking of its impact on our utility. To momentarily drop into the inadequate and false Benthamite philosophical psychology, the false philosophical psychology that underpins and has always underpinned the discipline of economics. We hold firmly to this inadequate and false philosophical psychology. In fact, we run with it. 
in spite of our knowledge of its inadequacies and falseness. And, you know, these estimates, guesses, barely even guesses, they do not fit with it. Um, these numbers are all estimates of the costs in terms of resources of producing commodities and the efficiency with which those resources are used to produce. There is, however, a huge wedge between use value and cost value, between use value to the human and exchange value in a market in which competition drives prices down to costs of production. We call that wedge user surplus. Simon Kuznets, back in the 1930s, laid down the principle that we would not try to estimate that. Why not? Because Simon needed a number for the aggregate size of the economy that he could calculate in his office in time for it to be of use to somebody. We still follow him, even though we could do better um, and ought you know, to know better. But the gap between market exchange value and typical human use value is enormous and often changing. And to look at the first, which this table does when we want the second, um, is extremely hazardous. Here is a very sharp example. There was a guy named Nathan Mayer Rothschild. He was the richest private citizen in the world. He was the richest private citizen the world had ever seen in the first half of the 1800s. He was dead in his 50s of an infected abscess in his butt. The use value to Nathan Mayer Rothschild of a single course of the antibiotics our biochemists and doctors have given us since the 1940s, that use value would have been very large to him, nearly the entirety of his wealth. He would have been willing to sacrifice it in order to see his grandchildren grow. Does that mean that every single one of us who has access to antibiotics has a use value of the commodities we consume or can consume that makes us far richer than Nathan Mayer Rothschild was? In a profound sense, yes. But then also, perhaps not. Nathan Mayer Rothschild's wealth had other purposes than merely allowing him to survive disease. His wealth gave him the social power to command the attention and obedience of hundreds of thousands, should he wish to do so. For many rich people or super rich people, that power to command attention and obedience is the principal source of satisfaction. Quote, it's no longer about what you can buy, it's about prestige, about receiving deference, about seeing them jump, as Paul Krugman once put it. And that social power to command the attention and obedience of others, that is by definition necessity zero sum. If you think that an important element of wealth is power to command, well, collectively, then we cannot grow wealthier. If you think that it is the power to manipulate nature and cooperatively organize ourselves that is more important, then each of us today is richer and more powerful than even the gods of the past. The Scandinavian god Odin, you know, played by the actor Anthony Hopkins in the Marvel comic book movies, one of his major powers was his ability to see and hear things far distant. He obtained this power by consulting soothsayers and by having two tame ravens who could talk. They would fly around the world, or at least around parts of Scandinavia, watching and listening, and they would return to whisper in his ear. But all of us today vastly outpower the god Odin in this dimension, which was one of his chief aspects which is important, um, which is important depends on who you are, on what you want to do, on what you think is best in life. And indeed, at this point, I'm reminded of a story from the secret history of the Mongols about how once the Mongol conqueror Genghis Khan asked Borchi Noyan, one of the chief of his lieutenants, what is the greatest joy and pleasure for a man? And Borchi said, it is go to the hunt on a spring day mounted on a beautiful horse holding on your fist a hawk and see it cut down its prey. No, said Genghis Khan, the greatest enjoyment of a man is to overcome his enemies, drive before him, snatch what they have, to see the people who they are dear with their faces bathed in tears, to ride their horses and listen to the lamentations of their women. 
two different very views about what wealth is and what is for. And these all bleed into each other. You know, say a book has come down to us, um, written by the Greek philosopher Aristotle around minus 350, you know, his politics. The first scroll of the politics is about economics, is about the acquisition, preservation, and use of resources, written from the perspective of an upper-class Greek landlord aristocrat philosopher of the minus 300s. Aristotle sees the science of oikos nomos, um, the study of the rules of household resource management, economics, the science of acquisition, he sees that as having four branches. The fourth and least important of the branches to Aristotle is the knowledge of production processes, technologies, and market conditions. You need to know these things. They are, quote, not unworthy of philosophy, unquote. Why not? Well, since you cannot make everything you need for a good life within your household, you have to trade and exchange, which means you have to decide what things your household will produce in surplus that you can then offer in exchange. Proper knowledge of technologies, production processes, and market conditions is essential then to keep from being cheated by your counterparties and to use your household resources well in this dimension in producing a useful surplus for you to trade away. But too great attention to this would be, Aristotle says, crude, or another translation would be in poor taste. It would tend to make you one of those people who tries to pile up wealth without limit and forgets what it is for, forgets how to live philosophically. So that's the fourth and least important branch of the science of acquisition. Another branch, you know, a more important branch than technologies and the marketplace is how to command your wife harmoniously. For she does not have your rational soul and her excellence lies in obedience and in following directions. Do note that here Aristotle is arguing against his teacher Plato and against Plato's teacher Socrates, who held the opposite view, that the souls and excellences of men and women were of the same kind. A still more important branch, says Aristotle, is how to exercise your royal rule as you raise your children properly. And the most important element of economics? It's how to boss your slaves so that they work hard and effectively to create the wealth so that you have the freedom and leisure to pursue your appropriate role in the political society that is the Greek city-state. This is, Aristotle says, how it is and how it always will be. Good societies need slaves and lots of them to be bossed around by those who excel in the rational elements of the soul in order to create a leisured class with the kind of skill, the experience, and the time to actually manage the society. And this will always be true, Aristotle writes, except in fantasies in which, quote, every instrument, every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, like the robot blacksmithing statues of Daedalus or the three-wheeled catering serving carts of Hephaestus which says the poet Homer of their own accord entered the assembly of the gods. The shuttle would weave and the plectrum touch the lyre without a hand to guide them. It is manifest therefore, Aristotle writes, that of people, some are slaves by nature and for these slavery as an institution is both expedient and just. Well, um, we today have, although our predecessors as late as 1870 did not, we have the robot blacksmiths of the inventor Daedalus. And while I have never seen a three-wheeled robotic serving cart, catering serving cart with sensors that Homer imagined the smith god Hephaestus could make, we could build them. We have the weaving machines and the music players. Nearly every song we think of is immediately accessible wherever we are. And robot factories exist that contain the looms, a human and a dog with as Berkeley Business School Dean Aaron Harrison says, the machines are there to weave the cloth, the dog is there to deter machine thieves, and the human is there to feed the dog. If it is the usefulness to us of our collective powers to manipulate nature and organize humans that matters more, 
the estimated jump from a 1300 to an 11,000 average annual income level vastly understates by how much our wealth exceeds that of all past ages and has jumped since the late 1800s. But if it is our net ability to see them jump that matters more, the estimated jump in my table overstates by far how much our greater wealth matters. Now let me move on to a little bit of economic theory. Um, by now I've set out some numbers, tried to count some things, guessed at some others, warned you that my counts are unreliable or perhaps of the wrong things, or maybe that there is no right thing to count here. But now let me stake out this table of numbers as a hill that I will die on and assume that it is true and draw out some more implications. And let me first do so by setting out a simple standard aggregate economic model. An aggregate production function with output per worker Y equal to capital intensity kappa raised to a parameter theta that measures the salience of capital relative to worker efficiency in production, all multiplied by the efficiency of labor E. An equilibrium condition that on the steady state balanced growth path and economy's capital intensity kappa will be the quotient of the economy's saving investment share of spending in total income S divided by the economy's investment requirements, which are the sum of the labor force growth rate N, the labor efficiency growth rate G, and the capital depreciation rate delta. Last, the efficiency of labor E is equal to the value H of the stock of useful ideas about technology, about how to manipulate nature and organize humans, times natural resources R per worker L, all this raised to one over delta, where delta is a parameter that governs the salience of ideas relative to resources. Um, the salience of ideas relative to resources in generating working efficiency. This is an economic model. It is all of three things. It is a useful filing system for analyzing growth. It is a powerful intuition pump for generating ideas about where in real empirical economies we should direct our attention in studying growth. And it also can be a pointless and exclusionary formal ritual that makes some voices hard to hear. I want to take this model seriously and make three further assumptions. The first is that over the long run, variations in capital intensity are unimportant and can be neglected. The second is that over the long runs, variations in the ratio of the labor force to the population are unimportant and neglected. We used to have a large share of children in the population. Now we have a large share of old people. The third is the value of the parameter gamma is CO2, that ideas are say twice as more important, twice as important as resources per worker in determining efficiency of labor. Under those assumptions, it is then the case that we can simply determine humanity's technological prowess at any moment in history, that its level of use, the useful ideas stock H, by simply taking our estimated or guessed level of output per capita and multiplying it by the square root of the population. So I'm then going to normalize this H by setting its value, um, by setting its value equal to one in 1870. And I'm going to calculate H's proportional growth rate looking back through history. And then I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in on the world as a whole for the past 500 years and the next 80. What can we say about human technology and its past and future likely pace of improvement? The first thing we note is that worldwide, the average rate H at which the deployed and diffused ideas stock H accessible to humanity has been growing. It's been 2.1% per year since 1870. And that rate, that's more than four times as fast as the rate of increase had been during the 1770 to 1870 century of the British Industrial Revolution, during Europe, which European colonialists had conquered, or in the case of Africa, south of Sahara, poised themselves to conquer, right, the world. And our 2.1% since 1870 over the past four generations. That's 14 times the pace of growth of the technological ideas stock 
during the 1500 to 1770 imperial commercial age. You know, that saw the Spanish Portuguese conquest of the Americas, the rise of European seaborne empires with their joint monopolies over an open trade and fortified ports, the West African Caribbean slave trade, and the Colombian exchange as the old world got corn, the potato, chocolate, tobacco, and the rest of new world biotechnology. And the new world got the animal and small grain based agricultural biotechnology of the old world, plus bubonic plague, smallpox, and conquest. And our 2.1% per year, that's 22 times the pace of growth from the pre-1500 agrarian age. So what we have seen and are still seeing and will almost surely see for most, if not all of your lifetimes, um, technological progress at a rate that before 1500 took a century, we see every five years and we see it progressing at the same, at that much higher proportional rate from a much higher substantive base. Managing that pace of extraordinarily rapid and net productive creative destruction in Schumpeter's terms, managing that in the interest of creating a truly human world is something that our governments and societies are not conspicuously excellent at you know, or succeeding in. Most conspicuous today and for my lifetime and for the lifetime, at least one or two lifetimes before me, um, among the failures of global economic management is the extraordinary failure of the technologies that have been developed since 1770 to fully diffuse across the world. The industrial rev innovations, you know, they had their initial start you know, in the Dover Circle. Um, in the Dover Circle, 300 miles in radius centered on the port of Dover in the southeastern corner of England. And technologies and institutions were then carried and diffused via the natural increase of the population there and its emigration, through conquest and settlement, through emulation by others, through osmosis, and through diffusion, um, and throughout, they diffused throughout, um, throughout the world. But they diffused only partially and incompletely and the result is that there today is a thing called the global north, which in its imagination at least traces continuity of descent and commonality of identity in some sense with the civilization of the Dover circle of half a millennium ago, a day half a millennium ago when the Dover circle was nothing special. And when no prince or merchant of the yellow Yangtze, Mekong, Ganges, Indus, Sir Amu, Sir Daria, Tigris, Euphrates, or Nile values, valleys would have wanted to change place with their counterparts of the Rhine, Meuse, Sen, or Thames values. And the result is that today um, there is a thing called the Global South, which is the rest of the world, which stood on average, at least on a par with the people of the Dover Circle in income and technology 500 years ago who today have average incomes less than 20% as high. This between society inequality may or may not now be in a process of long-term erosion, but it certainly wasn't a process of tremendous expansion and explosion of divergence from 1800 to at least 1980. The current four and a half to one edge of the global north relative to the world average it is principally due to differential creation and adoption of technologies, but secondarily and substantially due to the engrossment of a greater than equal share of the world's natural resources through conquest, occupation, you know, extortion, and bomb purchase. And Simon Kuznets back in 1971, you know, pointed out that this created very difficult problems. Um, for creating a truly human world, for realizing what ought to have been already the diffusion of technologies that are non-rival to enable general human wealth. Um, he pointed to factors that in his day have limited the spread of economic growth and the scary fact that Japan was the only nation outside of those with large chunks of their population rooted in European ancestry that had joined the group of developing countries 
and that the increasingly national cast of organization in developed countries made for policies clearly inhibiting convergence. Colonial status, you know, imperialist expansion, all of these neutralizing the remarkable institutions by which the Cynic and East Indian civilizations had previously produced huge unified societies that dwarfed in size any that originated in Europe until very recently. Nor, he warned back in 1971, is the social technology that evolved in the currently developed countries likely to provide models of institutions or arrangements suitable to the diverse institutional and population size backgrounds of many less developed countries. It will not be a matter of merely borrowing existing tools, you know, material um, or, and social, or of directly applying past patterns of growth, merely allowing for differences in parameters. The institutional requirements are likely to be particularly great in social and political structures. A long period of experimentation and struggle lies ahead. And this process will become more intensive and acute as the perceived gap widens between what has been attained and what is attainable. Nothing, nothing in the past half century, especially not the institutional dysfunctions we clearly see right now in much of the global north, suggests that these worries by Simon in his Nobel Prize lecture 50 years ago were overstated. Now, um, I do not have time. Um, I do not have time to more than observe that any assessment of societal wealth must deal not just with averages, but within society distributions as well. And that this is particularly true in a market economy. In a non-market or in a partial market economy, there are many sources of social power and so many ways to access resources other than through the control and expenditure of wealth. People then have rights springing from their membership in a status group, in a kin network, or in some other sociological institution. But in a market society, the only rights that are recognized, the only sources of social power, are property rights. And in a market society, the only property rights that are worth anything, those are those that aid in the production of commodities for which the rich have a substantial you know, market demand. As Amartya Sen, who I think still has my copy of Carl Polanyi's book, Trade and Market in the Early Empires that he borrowed from my office in 1990. Um, as Amartya Sen has stressed, an unequal market society will be one in which the market, and so society literally does not care whether those without wealth live or die. It is a matter of indifference to it because the only thing the market can see and thus care about are effective demands, and those without wealth have no effective demand for anything. Now, I do not have time and space or space to do more than gesture at within society inequality, you know, by gender, by ethnicity, by class, by status group, by kinship, etc. But any assessment of a society's wealth, or perhaps of a society's ability to make proper use of its potential wealth, any such assessment must assess not just averages, but the within society inequality dimension um, as well. I'm finding I have too much to say. Um, and so I think I should start winding up toward a conclusion. All right, that today has, um, has seen me undertake a towering construction but one truly based on a foundation of straw. You know, that is why I warned you back at the beginning that my saw my role as one of provoking and starting a discussion rather than providing solid and stable and conclusions one could call truly scientific. Nevertheless, to answer the question of how much more wealthy are we than our predecessors, the answer is 20. We humans today are 20 times as potentially wealthy as our predecessors were back in 1870. And our predecessors back in 1870 were themselves some 20 times as wealthy as our joint predecessors back in the early agrarian age 7,000 or so years ago. From the early agrarian age to 1870, however, 
increased human will, potential wealth in the sense of useful technological ideas stored up as a stock that humans could draw on. It was used overwhelmingly up until 1870 to support a larger human population and secondarily to enrich a larger, largely parasitic, if at times civilizationally glorious upper class, rather than for the betterment of the average or the typical human. Since 1870, with the coming of the demographic transition, we have done much, much better. Nearly any previous society would say that we today are certainly wealthy enough in per capita terms that it is truly surprising we have not used our collective wealth and distributed to create a real utopia, you know, a truly human world. Yet it is manifestly the case that we have not. However, I see very strong arguments that the factor of 20 is by far an underestimate. The factor of 20 is really an estimate of commodity value based on factor cost, an estimate based on use value on the material basis for human flourishing as it enables humans would see our relative wealth relative to our predecessors as vastly greater. And yet, um, an estimate based on the usage we have made of our potential wealth, it might be significantly smaller. For one thing, of the four freedoms that Franklin Roosevelt thought ought to be humanity's birthright, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear, only freedom from want can be directly and immediately secured by material prosperity. Yet a wealthy society, um, yet a wealthy society should make the benefits of impinging on the freedoms of others vastly less, and should make the difficulty of vindicating those other freedoms vastly less as well. And you can say that, and you would be right. Nevertheless, we as a species, as a community, have not vindicated and secured those other freedoms. Back before 1500, um, people, um, people located utopias when they thought about them, either in the heavens or in some past golden age or at the very least elsewhere on some distant island. That the way things were in this world, the near consensus was, in this fallen sublunary sphere at least, was that of the wheel of fortune. Again, to go back to Aristotle and Aristotle's framing, a monarchy decays and turns into a tyranny, which is overthrown by an aristocracy, which turns into an oligarchy. The oligarchy is then overthrown by a democracy, which decays into an anarchy, which is then succeeded by a monarchy again. In a cyclical process with a good and a down phase in every third of the wheel of fortune's rotation. But short of God or the gods coming down to earth, bringing a new Jerusalem, or at least bringing the three-wheeled robot catering serving carts that the Smith God Hephaestus, um, that the Smith God Hephaestus is busy making when Achilles' mother, the demigoddess Thetis, arrives to divert him from making the artifacts of peace to making the weapons of war for her son. Human history and wealth back before 1500 did not have a perceived direction. Now, starting in 1600, you know, a direction begins to appear. You know, Tommaso Campanella, in his book, The City of the Sun, writes about how there has been more historical progress in the past century he has seen than in all previous epochs, um, in all previous epochs, even though he somewhat ruins the effect by then attributing this progress to the astrological influences of the planet Mercury and the constellation Scorpio. Francis Bacon writes in his The New Atlantis that human society has been transformed utterly by the triple invention of the compass, gunpowder, and printing. And he calls for large-scale government-sponsored research and development to produce more new inventions to the enlarging of the human empire and the effecting of all things possible. I think that both of their reactions to the sight of our civilization today, our global civilization today, would be puzzlement and confusion. Why, given our technology-driven wealth, is the world today um, 
Is the world today not much more of a utopia than it actually is? Why have we collectively not done better with our technological power um, than we have? And I have a forthcoming book about this, focusing on 1870 to 2010, called Slouching Towards Utopia, forthcoming from Basic Books on September 6th, which I'm greatly looking forward to the publication of. Thank you very much for listening to me, for inviting me. It's been an enormous pleasure. Um, but I think I have talked for long enough, and I should let you have your turn to ask questions at least. Thank you, sir, for the insightful lecture. Uh, we can now move on to the questions from the audience. Yes, the board can unmute and ask your question. Okay. Yeah, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, technological growth. So uh, in a lot of growth models, uh, for example, like Robert Solos, we see that uh, technological growth plays a central role in uh, rising incomes. And uh, in growth accounting, this comes out as a total factor productivity growth. But, but how exactly do we uh, measure this and uh, this uh, what and what drives this technological growth? And uh, how do you explain uh, and how does this explain the slowdown during the 1970s or the uh, growth in uh, during the IT boom of 1990s? Um, explaining the pace of growth in technology, yeah, as you know it, is you know, extremely, extremely difficult and extremely, extremely partial. Um, you know, I have made a bold and heroic and deeply flawed attempt at even measuring it on a worldwide scale, simply by making a set of assumptions that allows us to back out the level of the technological ideas stock simply as average income per capita times the square root of population. And I bet that that will not be too far wrong. And then calculated growth rates um, of that stock you know, over various historical epochs um, in the past. If we, um, let me make this bigger. Yeah, I think that's visible. If we look at what's been happening since say the invention of agriculture, um, we see that for the first 6,000 years or so, we have what looks like a secular acceleration in the rate of ideas growth. You know, from 1% per century during the, from 10,000 to 8,000 years ago worldwide to 2% per century from the late Neolithic before the invention of writing and bronze to 3% per century or so during the Bronze Age to 6% during the early Iron Age. And these are the facts that um, my fellow graduate student and friend and now Nobel Prize winner, Michael Kremer, that led him to say that the basic model for technological progress is essentially that two heads are better than one. You know, that the population of the human race thinking about these problems, or at least this part that educated in science and technology and thinking about those problems as the principal determinant of the human rate of technological growth, maybe or maybe not aided by improvements in communications technology and improvements in protocols for technological research and development and so forth. And he wrote a very nice paper back when he was a graduate student um, about this. The problem is that then, um, that then we have um, the late antiquity pause, right? That between the year 150 and 800, you know, all across Eurasia, it, the population keeps growing, but 
as best as we can tell, population growth comes to a near standstill, and the world as of 800 has seen relatively little technological progress relative to what came before. And, you know, you can see it in different that, you know, the, at the, you know, at the eastern edge of Eurasia, the Han dynasty falls to nomad um, to nomadic incursions, to peasant revolts, and then to political fragmentation. And things don't really pick up again until the arrival of the Song dynasty in the 900s or so. That even the Tang dynasty is you know, beset by this enormous Anli rebellion, which knocks, either kills a third of the population or disrupts the ability to collect taxes from a third of the population of China. Um, in India, the Gupta and the Satavahana empires come under enormous pressure, perhaps from demographic decline. And in fact, the Kushans um, wind up establishing a not very durable empire over much of Northern India and beyond um, with substantial interruptions of civilizational progress. Further raids by Huns and succession of dynasties and others afflict the Persian empire. The Eastern Roman empire finds itself dealing with the rise of Islam, which greatly disrupts its ability to continue technological progress further. Although the Islamic civilization then becomes the light of the world around the year 800 and certainly serves as the road by which Europe managed to learn about Indian mathematics. And at the Western edge of Eurasia, you have the complete collapse of the Roman empire in the West and extraordinary depopulation falls in the populations of cities by 90% or so. So simply two heads are better than one, you know, is not adequate. And to say that the rate of growth of technological progress is sped up by good technological institutions in the form first of writing and then of empirical um, investigations, a la those of the classical Greeks or the classical Indians, um, and then printing, that doesn't seem to work either. Yeah, that is, after the year 800, after the year 800, we have a medieval recovery uh, that at least the square root income times the square root of world population um, sees a recovery to the rate to the kind of iron, early Iron Age rate even though the population of the world is much greater and there's more communication and you should see faster growth. Then we seem to see three discontinuous jumps. Um, one with the coming of the Columbian exchange and the imperial commercial European seaborne empires. One with the coming of steam power to Britain and its diffusion elsewhere. And the last with the coming of what Simon Kuznets called modern economic growth which he attributed to the coming of modern science, especially in the form of the development of the industrial research lab to develop technologies of the modern corporation to diffuse and deploy them and of full globalization to make that global diffusion possible. Um, this model of kind of discontinuous phase shifts in how research and development you know, discovery, development, deployment, and diffusion works, you know, appears to fit world history on a global scale, you know, over the past 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years. But that's not something that growth models are terribly good at helping us um, figure out and analyze. Indeed, back in the start of the 1980s, the brilliant Paul Romer made a bet that we were about to see a fourth growth acceleration. Simply that the rise increase in the number of scientists and technologists and researchers in the world, coupled with better information and research technology should push the growth rate up from 2% per year to something faster, um, did not turn out to be true. Chad Jones at Stanford has very interesting ideas about you know, how the low hanging fruit gets picked. And so technological progress becomes exponentially harder 
um, ideas that Bob Gordon has backed up with a lot of empirical evidence in his book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth. But I would say this is still a problem rather than something that we economists have answers um, for. Um, thank you, sir, for answering that question. Uh, the next person who's raised their hand, they can unmute and speak, Vishak. Yes, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask in your uh, estimated calculations, how exactly have you accounted for the changing value of skill of your labor and your technology? Um, we have not, we have rolled them in together. Uh, we simply have number of workers. Um, we simply have an assumption that the average capital intensity of the um, world economy, at least at a world scale, is relatively constant. Um, and so that's essentially an evasion of the problem, that we have not made any breakout between which of the skills are those that are genuinely non-rival public goods from the perspective of the economy as a whole, and which are painfully and laboriously acquired skills on the part of individual workers. And that I think is a major defect in the set of these calculations. But I haven't thought about trying to do a breakout and find that even more unconvincing than I found the table that I put up. Um, thank you, sir. Poonam, um, uh, you may go ahead with your question. Ma'am, you're on mute. I'm so sorry. Uh, so in the, in the light of what was uh, answered a minute ago, uh, you know, what about comparisons of, say, uh, work done by women? Because in the current way, the incomes are calculated. Uh, household work, domestic work is not included it, because it's not marketed. But if you go back 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, you know, there is no market even for, you know, right. work by men. So how do you, you know, compare this, uh, you know, I mean, you've yourself <clears throat> admitted that it, it's not a perfect exercise. I mean, nobody can really expect that, but have you been able to incorporate this fact? I have not been able to do so um, satisfactorily. You know, I am greatly looking forward to a forthcoming book by Alice Evans, which she has not yet written, um, tentative title being 10,000 Years of Patriarchy, right? That, you know, the very strange rise of male social dominance in the degree that it has taken since the invention of agriculture especially in plow-oriented societies. Um, you know, it's something that my friend and classmate, the late Alberto Alessina, um, wrote a very interesting article about in cooperation with Nathan Nunn and Paolo Giuliano. Um, you know, that I found extremely interesting and insightful. Um, you know, in general, I think the lesson is that the social value of women's work has been greatly undervalued, at least since the invention of agriculture, because of male status concerns in making it undervalued. And I remember, in fact, the large campaign waged here in California by relatively conservative right-wing economist Eddie Lazier about how the collective school districts of California had grown very used to having a near captive labor supply of female teachers for elementary schools who had very few other job options and was used thus to massively underpaying them and about how it was time for school districts to recognize exactly how valuable this work was and to deal with the fact that women now had other job options. Um, and yet 
he spent 15 years on this and was bitterly disappointed at his failure to make more progress. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Vanshika Jain. Uh, she asks, what is perfect allocation of wealth and resources according to what, uh, what, you, will, uh, what you put as a utopia? Oh, um, hmm. I find myself becoming more egalitarian, right? Um, as I age, at least. You know, that, that even kind of Rawlsian principles that things should be arranged, you know, for the benefit of the least well advantaged seem to me to be flawed. Um, because the least advantaged is a very different type of person, you know, in a very different society. Um, and that John Rawls's theory of justice assumed that there would, that there was going to be some kind of income hierarchy among people, and that the um, that those rankings would be relatively stable, and so you could justify inequality by telling the poorest that well, if we arranged any other society in any other way, you would be even poorer. You know, but say. Um, Right now, in this society, I am a relatively well-paid and high-status person, um, but I'm also fat and relatively uncoordinated and unathletic. And you put me back a thousand years ago, or say, and the person who's likely to be much higher status than me would be an effective warrior, um, someone like the Prince of Antioch, you know, um, a character in the movie Kingdom of Heaven, um, Reynaud of Châtillon. Um, and today, you know, Reynaud of Châtillon would be a laborer and the loading dock at some large you know, store you know, with anger management problems. Um, and I am a well-paid professor. Back a thousand years ago, he would have been the leader of, you know, at least the province of Ultra Jordan with his base at the castle of Carrick, and I would be lucky to be a scribe keeping his accounts. Um, and so I think the priority has to be that, you know, to create a society that is, in which the inequalities that exist are those, are only those that are absolutely necessary to incentivize that work that badly needs to be done, get done. Um, and that otherwise there is little justification for some people having more social power and thus more access to command and respect than others. But as I said, um, that a market society is one in which these differences in wealth become incredibly sharp because in every other society, yes, there is wealth, but there are other forms of social power which are distributed, if not more egalitarianly, at least not according to the wealth hierarchy. And, you know, diversification of sources of social power has to diminish kind of net inequality um, just by the law of large numbers. Thank you, sir, for answering that question. Um, Suprabhat, you may go next. Yeah, sir, um, in 1988, you worked extensively on Beaumont's convergence results. You yes. identified certain biases and such. This was largely for developed countries. And I wanted to ask, apart from the basic results that countries with similar savings rate, technological growth, converge to a similar study set, do you see some sort of convergence among countries in similar geographical regions like African countries or South American countries or Asian countries? And the second part of my question is, um, we studied, we have studied in our courses that it's not really possible to know how far a country is from its steady state, a solo type steady state in a broad sense. But if you had to throw a dart and say a country like India, where is it in respect to its growth path? How far is it? What would you consider to sort of estimate where it is and how far it is from its steady state? 
Um, but I think the answer to the first question is that since World War II, you know, there were kind of three regions in which empirically you see something that is convergence. And the first are the countries of the East Asian Pacific Rim, where aggressive land reforms um, plus a state that winds up with few intermediary powers in the sense of an upper class that very much wants to hang on to its kind of wealth, um, plus a, call it, bureaucratic, learned literary tradition, turn out to allow for um, an extremely rapid spread of industrial technologies and literacy and for substantial amounts of convergence, that when Simon Kuznets was writing, he was saying only Japan, but he was already 10 years behind the times because the four tigers, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong were already coming up rapidly. And now we would add um, to those would say that, well, gee, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, and even Indonesia, and also Vietnam, appear to be clearly on the same trajectory as is coastal China, with perhaps something different going on in the interior of China, you know, perhaps not, it is very hard to say. And this is one um, in which the kind of forces the Bommel identify that Bommel is right for the East Asian countries since World War II on along the Pacific Rim. The second are the countries that were um, remade by the US Marshall Plan policies and by their immediate absorption into the open free trade area of the OECD, and also where the United States, by virtue of waging the Cold War, was desperate that the countries become and stay democracies, um, that they too showed an amazing amount of convergence. And the third region is one of convergence too, but convergence in a very bad direction, right? That the countries of sub-Saharan Africa, you know, Zambia and Ghana are richer and more industrialized than Portugal, right, in 1950. And yet of all the countries of sub-Saharan Africa, you know, only Botswana and South Africa have managed to buck the trend. Um, and this was an unexpected trend. You know, African retardation was not something that people saw coming in 1950 or even 1960. You know, and why it exists is an extremely naughty problem. Um, Nathan Nunn, who is brilliant, you know, traces it to the social disintegration and general loss of trust you know, produced by the sheer scale of the um, Atlantic slave trade over three centuries. You know, arguing that such a large, such an enormously large shock has, has to have a large impact on historical memory and makes everyone presume that people outside their particular narrow circle of trust are not to be trusted. That rather than regarding everyone as a potential fellow participant in win-win market exchange, they think everyone is a potential adversary and enemy. But that did not hold before 1950. And there is an argument that Nathan makes about how before 1950 or so, African societies used the trust, the market trust infrastructure of the colonial powers, that individual African villages and enterprises could hook themselves into the colonial structure and use its trust in order to support economic growth before independence, but that after independence, the complete withdrawal of colonialism also destroyed the networks of trust that had supported, say, the relatively rich economies of Ghana and Zambia um, back then. And there's you know, a whole bunch of interesting series of books by a Stanford anthropologist named Ferguson, whose name I am blanking on about the anti-politics machine and so forth um, that are very much worth reading. Um, elsewhere, um, elsewhere, yeah, convergence does not seem to be the rule, at least not until 2000 swings around. 
And there is a very nice paper by Michael Kremer, and I'm blanking on the names of the other two co-authors right now that just came out oh, three months ago about how it may be time for us neoclassical economists to actually say we can see the convergence that our models expect, both from the solo mechanisms and from the fact that ideas are non-rival, is actually beginning to show itself in the world. And rather than have you know, the growth from two to one to five to one gap between the global north and the global south that we see happen from 1800 to 2000, that now they are starting to drop together again. But the answer to that is really in our, or rather in your hands. You, know, you are the people who are going to make convergence for the around the world happen, happen or not over the next generation. Thank you, Sam. So our next question is from Spash Jen. He asks, in your opinion, can macroeconomic estimates be made more reliable if we consider the impact of microeconomic variables too? If yes, why do we treat them as constants? Um, I think the answer is yes. I think there are a lot of people at Berkeley and elsewhere who are attempting to construct much more disaggregated and micro-based national versions of national accounts, um, looking at distributions rather than averages, taking very seriously wedges induced by monopolistic competition and market power, um, in an attempt to move to a next generation system of national accounts. And I do know this is one thing that Council of Economic Advisors member Heather Boucher right now has at the very top of her list as to what the US government should be doing or should be leading the way towards. Um, the problem is that Simon Kuznets and company who set up the national income and product accounts, you know, they really were geniuses and they managed to create a framework that was both very simple and very compelling and once you have generations of people who are used to this framework and invested in it, it's very hard to get them to think in any other way. And younger scholars and analysts coming out are trained into it and then invested in it as well. But we at Berkeley are anxious to hire people like Gabriel Zuckman and Danny Yagan and Emmanuel Saez, who are working along different directions towards successfully incorporating such micro considerations into our macro measures. Thank you, sir. I think that was our last question for today. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for answering all the questions. Uh, I request Poonamam, our staff advisor, to share a few words. Yeah, Professor uh, DeLong, thank you so much for your time. You're in a different time zone, and we're not even sure if you know, you're uh, taking out time out of your sleep to address all of us. We had a very large gathering, and uh, there's so much uh, you have packed in this hour. There's so much that we carry back uh, you know, to our classrooms, to our models. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing uh, uh, you know, a lot of references in you know the kind of people who are doing uh, different kind of things in this area um thank you also for um you know sowing the seed of doubt which is always great for knowledge you know to know that we know so little and whatever we know may be a big question like what we are running after what we're measuring is a big issue thanks for being so humble you know, sometimes uh, we forget, uh, you know, economic students, Delhi University, we kind of carry that chip. And, you know, coming from you that, you, you know, you doubt your work, that you like to improve on it, it means a lot to us. Sir. Um, and um, our, our wishes to Sanjay, uh, you know, whom, whose message you carried. Uh, and, and, we're truly honored to have you, uh, to have had you here today and answer questions, uh, you know. Thank you for also letting us know uh, once again that economists cannot um, succeed unless they take help from 
all the other sciences, social sciences, anthropology, sociology. I mean, there's so much you've already talked about. Uh, thank you for that. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you for that. Um, you are very welcome. You know, I am honored to be asked. And let me say that anyone who has more questions, who is too shy to ask them, you know, email them to me at delong at econ.berkeley.edu, and I will try my best to think of good answers to them. Uh, but this has been a great pleasure for me and has helped me to clarify my thought in lots of important and interesting ways. And it has been a great pleasure for me to appear virtually in this context. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request Rupali to please give the word of thanks. Thank you, Arun. On behalf of the Economic Society, St. Stephen's College, I deem it a great honor and privilege to extend my heartiest thanks to our honorable speaker, Dr. Bradford DeLong, who bestowed us with insightful information about the economic history and growth of India. I'm sure every one of us is enlightened by his knowledge and presence. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to our principal, Professor John Burgess and Bursar, Dr. Gaitu, who gave us the opportunity to organize this insightful lecture as a part of the National Economics Festival. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our staff advisor, Ms. Poonam Kalra, for her constant support and motivation in all our endeavors. We'd also like to thank Anurag sir, Manjula ma'am, Sanjeev sir, Somin ma'am, Neema ma'am, Shrishti ma'am, Divya ma'am, and Abhishek sir for gracing the event with their presence. Lastly, we'd like to thank Prof. Gray Mather for sponsoring our event and supporting our efforts. We're extremely grateful to our audience for their active participation. Thank you everyone for joining, and we hope you had a great learning experience. Thank you so much, sir, for joining in. And we can't wait for your book to be published as well. And I'm pretty sure all of us are wanting to read that as well. Thank you so much. It was a very insightful lecture.